speak. How are you? Can you hear me? Okay, we're not hearing you a second. Mm. Okay. I get the song working. Give me two minutes. I got to get the song. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so we got to get this turned off. Uh, okay. Okay, we're getting the song checked. Um, you're not going to see the room, right? I can kind of, can kind of do it. Can you pan to the to the right? <laughs> I see some people. Don't move because you knocked the computer. <laughs> And once I get you started, I'll put you on full screen. I don't think we're going to be able to do questions. I don't know if they're going to be able to hear you, right? If they'll be able to hear me? Yeah, I don't know. Did you get him? Joe's <laughs> down. Am I the first dial-in? in Okay, so two minutes, we're running late. Please hold. <laughs> Your call is important. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're the first dial in today. Yes. You and uh, Kevin are the only two dial ins. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, I can't get the song. Hi, Zane. How are you? Yeah. How are you, Joe? Uh, Good. Sound right? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, what I'll do, Zane, is while you're talking, I'll turn off the webcam. And then, once you're done, so 30 minutes when we start. Say again. I'm sorry. One more time. You have 30 minutes. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll kill our webcam, put you up full screen, ah. and then come back in. All right? Is either that oh, you're going to take mine? Okay. Um. <laughs> Speak, Zen. Can you hear me now? No. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Is your mic working, Zen? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've got. Uh... It's on. Uh, you need to do a restart or anything? Or? Yeah, I'll maybe just restart this because there is sound coming from Okay, you stay on. I'm going to come off and come back in, all right? Okay.
Talk. There we are. There we are. There Perfect. Go. Oh, nice. Okay, give it. Give us two minutes. Everybody's in time. I'll introduce you, and we'll start. Okay. Hey, I can answer questions if you want. It's uh, good either way. You can, yeah. Yeah, I can answer them if they have stuff at the end. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> Thanks, Denise. <laughs> I don't know where. Have we got something to put on? Do you want to? Uh, actually, that might be Today we're going to move you to an more comfortable position. That sounds nice. You put me on the couch. <laughs> that sounds even better. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, that's good. I can see people. Yeah. So what we'll do is actually, if you give me that back there, down there. Is that working? That, yeah, I can hear. It. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Okay. This is going to be interesting. You the video. It's been recorded. Yeah. I can invite you to the other video. Say hello. Okay. You're on the telly. Hola. <laughs> Mommy, you're on the telly. So, guys, we're. Can you see us? Yeah. Can you hear us? See, you can see. You can see you, but you can see. He's very nice. They said you're very nice. I said oh, good. I didn't say that. I didn't. So that better? Okay, guys. Um, I know we put we put up the people in the loo and that's so, what we'll start. I'll introduce you there then and we'll get started. Uh, so those that you know, they can hear you. Okay, so you can ask questions. Welcome to the 24 session. Um, I will leave the screen open big so whoever's there is on the telly. So today is the, it works for a company called Mandalese. Uh, and as I said this morning, most of us have never heard of Mandalese. It actually sounds like a strange animal. And um, what the reality is they own Cadbury's, Oreos, uh, Ritz crackers, and so many very good few healthy brands that's on the He can't hit me with America. He's <laughs> uh, they, they works with all of the, Top people he brings in, in Mandalis, he brings in the training, he does all this stuff, and he's going to talk about an interesting thing that's happened. And the reason we asked Dane in is, you know, okay, what have we got in common with a Fortune 100 company? We're a Fortune 100 company, not 500. Uh, is the fact that they use people that don't work in office. Right? So they outsource a lot of their people, so the people are not coming in, uh, and they've got what would you call it? He's much the place to so he's going to talk about how Mandalese actually runs that type of business with getting more productivity out of their people and the rest because, you know, especially today with rents and all the rest of it, you get more than So I'm going to shut up and Zane, it's all yours, darling. Thank you, sir. Can everybody see me, hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, beautiful. Tony, uh, thanks for uh, for having me in here. I'm I'm uh, I'm honored to be part, part of this um, event. I'm excited to be talking to you um, and, and honored to, uh, to be able to help with uh, with the homeless situation in Dublin, so uh, or in Ireland, so this is just a really cool thing to uh, to be here and be able to talk to you. As Tony said, my name is Zane Corrier. I'm here in the states. I'm uh, I'm based in uh, Durham, North Carolina, which is right uh, right in the middle of the East Coast. Really, if I were to take a plane straight across the Atlantic, I'd end up in Morocco. So that's where I'm located uh, located in the world. Um, I work for a company called Mondelez International. We're a global Fortune 100 company. Um, I have uh, I've built a 17 plus year career uh, with them. I've, I've uh, and I've worked in several different functions in that company, from merchandising to sales to HR to training, and uh, and learning and uh, and development. I've seen a lot of interesting things happen. From from um, uh, I, I led a team once, a sales team once, where we broke the uh, the region sales record. This is a remote team, so uh, there there were just some 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 of the stuff I'm going to talk about today will attach to this. Um, but we ended up doing almost a million dollars in a week, which is a which is a region uh, record. It still stands today, um, and uh, and that's a lot of cookies and crackers. Just to be honest with you, that was a lot of cases. But uh, but that was a fun uh, that was a fun week. Um, currently, I'm uh, a a global learning manager. My area of responsibility covers about a hundred thousand employees uh, in North America, Central America, South America, and then uh, Western. Europe. And what I do is I help people uh, with goal setting and achieving their professional and personal goals, leadership skills, and building high performing teams. And then in that high performing team section comes 
this idea of developing uh, remote workforce and virtual teams. So uh, I'm uh, I'm lucky. I, I've never worked in an office in my life. I've always been remote. I've either been out in the field or at home. So is anybody familiar with uh, with the Office, the TV series, either the British version or the uh, the American version? So I was talking to one of my friends a couple of years ago, and uh, I was we were laughing about the uh, the show, and um, and and I love both, by the way. I think they're both brilliant. And I was saying, there's no that's insane though. Nobody acts like that in an office, right? And my friend looks at me and says, "You've never worked in an office, have you?" And so we kind of laugh, right? Because it, it it sounds like that's kind of insane. So I've avoided all of that, and I've managed to uh, to work my whole career um, as um, uh, 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 for, as a remote worker. And then you know, as a direct result of that and meeting Tony and so on, I started my own firm called Fortune 500 Insights, where I, I get to teach people like yourselves uh, stuff that we're going to talk about today, like remote working. And so I, I kind of want to dive into that for a minute. Who, has anybody ever heard of remote working or virtual working? Is that a term that you're familiar with? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Some people, yes. Okay. So remote, remote working basically means that your employees work from home. And that can be a, a, a disconcerting thing for business owners and um, uh, and employers alike because you really don't know what your employees are doing throughout the day. But I've got some interesting statistics that I think you're going to uh, to like because these are statistics that work in your favor. Um, and then everybody in here is a business owner. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, I see head shaking. Good. Okay, so. There's, there's been multiple studies done, and you can, um, depending on which study you're looking at, you're going to find two to three percentage points above or below the stats that I'm going to give you. It really depends on the study and the methodology and so on, but these statistics hold as an average. Remote workers tend to be 21% more productive than workers who come into an office. So, you, so if you have a remote workforce, if you're willing to step out there, uh, be brave and, and institute this kind of program for your workers. If you have five employees uh, and you get 21% more productivity out of them, then you've essentially hired a new employee without having to hire an employee, which is a huge benefit to you. Because uh, does anybody have any idea how much it costs to hire somebody? Have you done that analysis before? Yes, no. What'd you say, three quid? <laughs> it, it costs, if, if you're gonna hire somebody at, at the low, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what minimum wage is in, in Ireland. Here it's, um, I don't even remember what it is here, but uh, but it's over, I think it's right around 10 bucks an hour, something like that. Um, if you hire somebody at the lowest you know, ladder uh, in, your, in your company hierarchy at, at that rate, um, it's going to cost you somewhere around $3,500 to $7,000 to hire somebody. And that's everything from real cost all the way up to opportunity cost, which is, you know, lost productivity from the vacancy all the way up to you using your time to do the job or having somebody else do that job for you. And so there, there's a big cost associated there. So one of the key benefits for you up front is just to, to get 21% more out of your people. Um, you can essentially hire on another person if you have five employees. That's really the way that it works out. We also know that globally, uh, about 70% of the workforce, again, a couple, two or three points on either side of the statistic based on the, based on the study that you read, 70% uh, of the workforce globally is disengaged. Does anybody have any idea how much money a disengaged worker will cost you? Lots? That's, that, can you be a slightly more specific? I'm just curious if you have an idea. <laughs> it is lots. I agree with you. No idea. So, so a disengaged worker, uh, and th this is based on uh, several different multivariance uh, studies across uh, uh, different um, uh, independent uh, organizations who do these kinds of studies. But, but what they found is a disengaged worker is going to cost you roughly $3,200 per every $10,000 in salary that they make. And so if you, you've got a seven out of 10 shot at having a disengaged worker uh, in your organization, and they're costing you a lot of money because they're, they're, they're being unproductive, um, they're not doing their job well, they're, they're not executing well, and they're hurting you uh, on, on whatever it is that you hired them to do. 
And so disengaged workers are, are bad. Uh, not just from the standpoint of they're going to cost you time, they're going to cost you money as well. So you want your employees to, to be engaged. Um, if you've never thought about in, employee engagement, I would encourage you just uh, to, to research it and, and do some work there with your group. You don't have to do a lot of complicated stuff to, 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 to engage your people. So uh, I would encourage you to, to do that because an engaged employee, you're going to get 31% more productivity out of them than you would just a, an employee of average engagement. So you want your employees to be bought in. You want them acting like an owner. You want them to care about the mission, vision, purpose, values of your organization so that you can get as much out of them as they possibly can. And what we find is when they do that, you're, you're going to uh, build this interesting cycle of, of engagement and productivity because they become more engaged, become more productive, they feel more fulfilled, and they're willing to give more. And if you're familiar at all with, um, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that the highest point on that pyramid is, is to have a sense of purpose and belonging larger than yourself. If you can create that in your organization, now you've got some magic happening because people are going to be swept up in your wake. A lot like if you're a plane going down the runway who's, who's sweeping up debris behind it, right? You're going to pull your, your people along with you when you can do that. And, and creating a remote working program is going to be helpful for you. So how does it engage employees? So what, what it does is it, they become more productive. Uh, there's no more commute. So you're saving them on average probably uh, 30 minutes of drive time to work and from work. Uh, that's what it is over here. I'm not sure what it is in Ireland, but you're safe. Yep. Who's? I see a hand. 45 minutes round trip or one way? Each way. Good Lord. So you're saving them 45 minutes. So you're saving them an hour and a half a day. And you just imagine that when, when, how much more engaged and grateful are they going to be to you if you save them an hour and a half of their lives every day? Right. That's you're talking seven and a half hours a week. Math's not my strong suit. So multiply that over the weeks and months and uh, and you get some, some big numbers. So you're saving them that amount of time where they can get up and have breakfast with their spouse, their kids. They can read the paper, watch TV. They don't have to get up before the sun's up in order to accomplish that. That in and of itself is a massive benefit. Plus, they don't have to pay the, the gas costs that they drive or the public transportation costs if that's a cost where you are. So you're saving them time, you're saving them money, and they're getting that time back to spend with their family, friends, or themselves as they would like uh, to do that. It also gives them more flexibility time. And it, I've seen this uh, just in my own, from my own personal experience, as well as the experiences in, in, in people that I've managed and supported across the Mondelez organization is you have more flexibility. You, you can plan your time in such a way that you can go watch your daughter's ballet recital at one o'clock without missing a beat. And then you're back home and boom, you're in your office getting work done. So a person's quality of life and their, the, the balance that they have in life uh, it, it is going to increase significantly. And so again, if, if you're familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I saw some people shaking their heads, you're gonna connect to that in a very deep way. And that makes people feel not just more engaged, but more loyal to you as an employer. Because when they leave you, if people leave, typically a person, about 50% of the time, somebody leaves you because of you. It's not for another job. It's not for another, it's not for more money. It's because they don't like the way that your company culture is set up. And so you, you can mitigate that to a massive extent by allowing people that kind of time of flexibility and save you the money of having to go back out and then hire somebody to replace that person. And that money adds up over time as you do the sourcing, interviewing, hiring, onboarding, training, and getting them up to speed to where they need to be. So you're saving yourself a tremendous amount of money and time just by taking the people that you have and making the work environment work better for them. So if things are more flexible for them. They have more personal time. They have more family time. They're more engaged. And they're going to become more loyal to you over time than they would otherwise. So that's what's in it for them. Now, what's in it for you as an employer? So, you know, Tony mentioned at the top, I know rent, uh, renting out an office is expensive. And so imagine what that would be like for you if you could get rid of your office. Now, if you're in manufacturing or something like that, that, that can't be done remotely, right? But if you have workers that you could send home, what would happen if you could eliminate or, or downsize your office? 
And what would that mean for your bottom line if you could just cut those costs? So it's, it's not always about increasing sales. Sometimes if you can decrease costs, you know, your margins get better. And so what would that look like for you? So no office space or smaller office space. The other big thing it does for you, if you have uh, an office space and your team is all co-located, which means they all come into the office to work, you are geographically limited to the people who live in your in your city, who, who are you know close enough to come. And so you cut yourself off from some amazing talent that exists outside of where you are um, that you can't access because they can't drive from France or Australia or the States or Canada or India or the Philippines to get to the office. And, and so w once you open up those borders, and I know you've been talking a lot today about digitizing your systems and processes for your business to drive sales and cut costs. This is about digitizing your workforce and locating people all over the globe who can do what you want to do. And it just, it gives you access to a broader talent. And there's some really uh, 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 smart, intelligent, creative, productive people out there who, who are waiting to, to be hired. And so those are two, I would say those are the two biggest benefits for you. Your workers become more engaged and productive and it gives you access to a talent pool outside of where you are. Um, and it also saves you time. When people become more productive, when they become more engaged, they start acting like owners and you don't have to be on them all the time. So who, who has ever had an employee who you've had to, you know, just be on top of and push constantly and anybody have that have had that before like anybody who's ever managed or led anybody else could probably raise their hand and so um it's going to save you the time from having to to do that because people are they're automatically going to become more engaged and productive and i've, and I've seen that a lot uh, i've seen that happen a lot once they're trained and up and running uh, they tend to do well so so the question that typically get at this point is uh how do i know my person who's working from home, who lives in a different country, isn't just sitting on the couch with their feet up watching TV and burning time, right? Is anybody wondering that? Yes, yes. You should be wondering that I, I, because yes, that, that is a very logical thing to wonder. So so here's, and, and here's what I would say to that because my, um, I have felt the same way in the past. How do I know that that's not happening? If you're in an office, you know exactly what your employees are doing when you're standing right behind them, looking over their shoulder and, and examining what they're up to, right? Then you can know you're seeing. But if they're in their cube and you're in your office, you you have no idea what they're doing. Now they're not going to be at home with you know bag of potato chips, feet on the on the up on the couch watching TV, but they may be surfing the internet and doing and wasting a lot of time. So it's kind of a myth that if they're co-located in an office, they're going to be more productive because you're there. They'll be more productive when you're standing right behind them, unless they just don't have a brain in their head. But otherwise, uh, you, you really don't know what they're what they're doing. And so allowing people to work remote, nobody likes to be micromanaged. I shouldn't say that. Most people don't like to be micromanaged. Most people don't like that. Adult. We know that adults, uh, from, from all the studies on adult learning and and uh, uh, principles of the adult brain. People like to be self-led, self-motivated, self-directed. They like to have a sense of liberty and freedom over their time and space. And so feeling like I am standing over them, watching what they're doing every step of the way is going to be a disengaging thing. That's just not fun for anybody. And so it really is a myth that people in an office are more engaged. Some of the most engaged people I've ever led have been, uh, I've never met in my life. Uh, I've just met them through through the computer. And we developed a company culture and a team culture that worked really well. And, and they out they outperformed and outproduced what I set for them to do because I set up some parameters beforehand and they met those things. They felt respected and trusted uh, and dignified because I trusted them to do what they wanted to do. And, and then they're off. And then in those instances where people prove that they can't be trusted to do what they need to do, then, then that's where you come in and micromanage. And you can do that from a remote perspective as well. You, you don't have to be standing over them constantly examining what they're doing. So let's talk about how to do it. So I'm going to give you some steps about how to set this up. If you're interested in doing this, if you have a remote workforce, um, then 
you can do this retroactively and just put this into place for yourself. Uh, the first thing I would encourage you to do is set clear expectations. So that is important. It, it's, it's very important that your expectations be very clear um, and concise and simple. It's more important to have that for a remote workforce than it is for people in the office. Because when they're in the office, they can just come ask you. They can ask a coworker if they're not sure about something. And so ensuring that expectations are set up front are, are very clear. It's also uh, important to make sure that the, the goals and the metrics that you need for them to hit on a daily, weekly, monthly basis are absolutely clear and dialed in and that they that you are aligned with them on those things and that they're working toward those things uh, on uh, an ongoing basis. Um, so so that, that would, those would be the two things. Just from a ways of working perspective, make sure that they understand what they're supposed to do and how they're expected to behave at work. If you want them to start at 8 a.m., they need to know, look, that's not flexible. I need you in your chair at 8 a.m. Uh, if you need for them to work a certain amount of hours today, that's what you need them to do, right? But, but make sure that they understand that and then make sure that they understand exactly what it is that they're chasing. Um, this is a very simple thing, the next one, uh, but I've found that it pays off big because it's, again, just a sign of respect. But ask people what their preferred style of communication is. Do they like a phone call? Would they prefer text? Do they prefer Facebook Instant Messenger, Google, you know, uh, uh, Google Hangout, video chat? What uh, email? Um, what is it that they like the best? Me, I can't stand email. If I have my choice, I tell people, you know, don't email me. Do it a different way. But email is the, the worst way to contact me. And so people tend to like that uh, because you're going to be communicating with them in the style that they, that they would prefer. Video is also preferred when you meet with your remote workers um, because you can see each other. Human beings pick up context and subtext and they connect uh, primarily primarily off of visual cues. So people will be watching your body language, your, 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 your uh, uh, eye connection. They'll be watching your face. Is, you know, are you smiling? Is your face dropping? Are you frowning? People use that to, to read where you are. And so if, if, if you're looking to really engage your employee and build a relationship with them from a remote perspective, it's very important uh, that they be able to see you. And so almost all of my remote meetings, uh, not all of them, because sometimes it just doesn't work out, but almost all of them are done uh, over video for that very reason, because you're, you're engaging and building a relationship. It serves two purposes. It serves the purpose of the meeting and the, the meta purpose is to build that relationship by looking each other in the eye and having a conversation. So those those are the I would encourage that with with the video. Um, have frequent one on ones with your remote team. What I mean by that is uh, you do want to have team huddles. So you want team huddles maybe uh, every two to four weeks where you bring the whole team in and you huddle up and and you talk about roles, rules, expectations, what's going well, what's not going well, the things that aren't going well, what can we do differently? And you'll do the same thing in one-on-ones with your people. It's, it's more important that you have established one-on-one uh, -on -one calls with them. Th 30 minutes at a time works uh, really well. You can pretty much cover everything that you need to cover in that time. But a weekly one-on-one -on -one where you and I can sit down just, you know, in a, this hypothetical situation. We're working together. You and I can sit down and look each other in the eye. You can tell me what's going on for you. Are you overwhelmed? Do you not have enough work? Are things you know, going well? What's going on? And then let's talk about that and, and talk about what's going well, what's not working, what can we do differently? And we're building that relationship on, on a weekly basis so that and it, does, it serves two purposes. You're, you're building engagement. You're building community with, with your employee. You're building loyalty with your employee and trust with your employee. Uh, and so they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to, to, to stick around. Them. What it also does is it, it lets them know every Tuesday at nine o'clock, I'm having a conversation with, with the owner and I don't need to call her randomly anymore because, because I know Tuesday at nine o'clock, unless it's an ultimate emergency, we're going to talk then. So it's going to buy back some time for you because they know exactly when you're going to talk to them and then they can, you know, give you feedback and just kind of, dump on you of whatever it is that they have going on and things aren't going well or they can share successes with you. But that would be the time to do that. Uh, also consider developing a rewards and recognition program. When I was in, uh, when I was in uh, first grade, 
I read, I'm still proud of this. It's ridiculous. That was the first grade, but I read 500 books. And, uh, and so for every 50 books, I got a, a, a medium sized star for every hundred books. I got a big star. Adults still love getting stars. They just do, but they look different, right? So you're not giving them a gold star, but so a reward and recognition doesn't have to necessarily be a monetary bonus. Um, it, it can be any kind of, it can be a certificate, an award, a pat on the back uh, that you do publicly. Um, those kinds of things go a long, long way to, to, help, to helping your employee grow roots into your organization so that they stick around through the good times and the bad times. Because, you know, again, people who leave cost you money to replace. And, and I don't want that to happen to you. So, uh, so those would be the, um, the primary ways to, uh, to set that. I wanted to leave time at the end for questions. If anybody had any questions. Okay. I'm all about saying your content is great, but saying when I did my talk earlier, I mentioned your original, when you launched your product using the expert and, and your spend on Facebook and you got no return. And then I mentioned this year and your $29 and your 3K of sales. <laughs> so, <laughs> you all, do you want to talk about that for a second? I'm happy to. Okay, let's talk about that. Well, that was so, so yeah, so here's what I would say. Um, I started a business a couple of years ago and it, it didn't work. So I wanted to take it digital and it didn't work because I didn't know what I was doing. So, you know, Tony taught me one, Tony said one thing when I first met him that, that stuck with me. He said, the great thing about the internet is it's easy and anybody can access it to build a business on the internet. The problem with the internet is it's easy. Anybody can access it and try to build a business on the internet. And that's what I tried to do. And it failed miserably. And so, um, because I didn't know what I was doing, it seemed simple and easy, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I got lucky enough to meet Tony and then through Tony and met Denise. And we, we started working on some business ideas and ways to market them. And, uh, you know, honestly, the, the first thing that we tried, uh, it didn't work. And that was hard because my first thought was, here we go again. But, uh, but Tony is great. I mean, he's, he was behind, beside me the whole time, you know, to the right, Denise is beside me to the left and they're saying, it's okay. This is normal. We've got, you know, you're establishing your market, you're developing your market and, and it's, so this is going to, it's going to come just trust us. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll trust you. So I was going to do a leadership program and I was going to launch a leadership program in January. And Tony says to me, I think you should launch a goal setting program because that's, that is more seasonal right now. And I said, okay, because I trusted him. And so I put together a goal setting program and ran some Facebook ads. Um, and then we started getting clicks and I get excited. This is awesome. And then we had people sign up for the webinar and I was excited. I've never had anybody sign up for a webinar before, uh, digitally. And so now I'm really excited. Um, I mean, I, I've, so I've spoken to, to thousands of people across the globe in my job and that's fun, but I was so excited to have nine people turn up for a webinar that was my own. I was like, this is the best thing ever. This is cool. Uh, and so I did the webinar and, and nobody, people were engaged. It went really well, but nobody signed up for, for the program that I was offering. So in the program I was offering was to help people achieve their goals in 2018. So their, their business goals. And I went back to Tony and I said, so we, so we got further than we've ever gotten before um, to, you know, to, to um, uh, have people sign up for the webinar and show up. How can we get sales? Tony looked at my presentation, we tweaked some things, uh, went back out there and, and ran, the, uh, ran the, the new webinar and then sales started coming in. And so it's, it's kind of magic. Like it felt like magic to me a little bit that stuff started working, but it, but it really was just a matter of, Carving over time, taking a look at the data that came back, what worked, let's keep doing that. What didn't work, let's let's tweak it and do some things differently. And then, you know, once we found something that worked, we shove all our chips to the middle of the table and boom, there we go. And and that's worked. Like I can't, 
I can't believe the return. You know, I, I was in a mastermind in Boise, Idaho three years ago when I first learned about internet marketing. I had no idea. They were talking about SEO and PPC and, and CPC and Facebook ad. I had no idea what they were talking about. I kept looking at my business partner like, what are, we, what are they talking about? I don't know what they're talking about. So it was, a, it was not the best use of their time, but um, Tony simplified it for me and, and helped me, just helped me figure it out. And so we just carved and carved and carved uh, until we got there, and I'm I am incredibly happy with the. I mean, those results are insane, right? So when I was in that, I was in that. Con Sorry, Tony. I can tell you want to say something. Just give me a second. When I was, he's gonna, he's gonna shut me down. Uh, I so what I learned at that con. The reason I brought up Boise is this, it was one of the top internet marketing experts uh, in the country. He says if you can get a two to one return on your ad spend that is insane like that's what you want that's 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 what you want to get and if you can get anything more than that that's gravy and, and mine is 10 plus 10 plus x ad spend i i mean what more do i want that's christmas thanksgiving independence day and and new year's eve all in the all rolled up into one thing it's so yeah i'm i'm over the moon about it that's that's what i have to say i don't know if you have any questions but uh I'm happy to no, answer whatever you want. Time, so I'm out of time. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All Thanks, time. Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. I'll talk to you later. Have a nice all right, man. Have a good day, honey. See you guys.